Hello, Tim Sandal back with you with a, another part of the Annex One uh, video series and um, this is now looking at the more substantial parts of Annex One following on from our general introduction um, last time and the first kind of key subject is to do with premises. So what does Annex One, the revision to Annex One say about um, premises. Okay, so the first kind of essential um, point is that the manufacture of sterile products should be carried out in clean rooms of the appropriate grade and that access of people has to be via changing rooms and the changing room should act as an air lock and then there should be separate access for all other items again via airlocks of the appropriate cleanliness standard. So in other words, people should not be transferring things through changing rooms and people should not be using airlocks designed for equipment and other materials as a transfer route. The Annex also says as part of its clean room design aspect is that all clean rooms must have HEPA filtered air. OK, so the next important uh, part of the premises section says that all of the controls, so that's HEPA filter grades, pressure differentials, air change rates and so on, and the monitoring regime should be scientifically justified and also be capable of evaluating the state of environmental conditions. So we need to know in real time whether our clean room is functioning properly. So this means alarms, low airflow rate alarms, low pressure alarms and so on and using well designed facilities as with the airlocks and also pass through for the more critical areas. And we also need to have within the clean room the appropriate technical and operational separation measures to prevent mix up and contamination. So that's either contamination getting into a product or two different types of products um, being used and risk of cross-contamination or one product being followed by another product. So the concept of transfer is really important. This gets a really big emphasis in this section that the UGMP Annex 1. So the Annex is saying here that the transfer of equipment and materials into and out of a clean room and critical zones represents probably the greatest source of contamination. It also further says that any activities with the potential to compromise the cleanliness of a clean room needs to be controlled. Um, and for aseptic processing areas, the um, process of getting um, items in and out of a clean room should ideally be by sterilization such as using double-ended autoclaves or the deparagination tunnels. If this isn't possible, then there should be a validated transfer disinfection method, ideally automated, such as a biodecontamination chamber with grade A air or a pass-through hatch um, designed to protect the higher grade environment, having effective flushing of active filtered air supply and using a manual uh, disinfection method. Um, in relation to this, the Annex also continues with this whole transfer concept and it's saying that only materials and equipment that appear on an approved list, and that's a list approved by quality department, and can go into the clean room. And these also need to be developed during the validation of the transfer process. So the transfer process should take into account all of the different types of items going in. And this is particularly important for entry into a grade B clean room or into a grade A area. And it needs to be controlled with those measures that I mentioned. All airlocks that um, lead into a grade B area or into a grade A zone have to have an interlocking system in place and that they also need to have visual or audible warning systems and the need for a visual or audible warning system 
also applies to grade C and grade D clean rooms and, and the airlocks between them. Um, the annex also discusses um, further aspects of the design of the clean room. Um, so it's saying that all surfaces must be smooth, impervious and unbroken. They also need to be cleanable. You've got to be able to clean without generating contamination. So the clean room itself must not be a source of the shedding or accumulation of particulates or microorganisms. And it also must allow the repeated application of cleaning agents, disinfectants and even sporocytes. There also needs to be no dust within the clean room and this is addressed by cleaning but also in the design concept so there are no recesses to collect dust um, and there's a particular warning in the annex about doors and also about say tops of um, mobile unidirectional devices or, or other pieces of equipment. There's also a strong emphasis that ceilings must be adequately sealed, especially around HEPA filters. And here, because there's a, there's a risk of air that's not going through the filter, getting in, and then you've got the risk of fungal contamination or, or other forms of contamination. The annex also says that all materials within the clean room, all pieces of equipment and all stationary pieces of equipment, must have minimal particle generation. There's also reference to sinks. So sinks are not permitted in any grade A or grade B area. And where sinks and drains appear in other clean rooms, grade C and grade D clean rooms, then they have to have measures in place to prevent backflow of contamination. So there's going to be air breaks and, and traps and other design features. Other clean room design aspects that are important, this are also described within the annex, are that um, between clean rooms of different grades or of different um, purposes, say between a corridor and a process room, then the minimum pressure differential is 10 pascals, but it often may need to be higher. So the set points for pressure differentials should all be detailed within the contamination control strategy and every interface justified within that contamination control strategy. The annex also says that um, ideally this is alarmed and every alarm excursion must be adequately assessed. There's also within the clean room reference to conducting airflow patterns and this says this should be visualised in every grade of clean room in order to demonstrate there is no ingress from lower grade areas to higher grade areas, no air from less clean areas such as contamination on the floor rising upwards and also the absence of any air directed over operators that might then be ingressing into a high grade area and this is particular concern when operators are in grade B interfacing with grade A or even within grade A and the air being distributed to somewhere critical. And it's really important that unsatisfactory air flows are addressed through design improvement and that air flows, as the annex says, are assessed both in the at rest and in operational conditions. The annex also emphasises that quality department must be able to observe what's going on within the clean room and also for auditors and other visitors. So they can either be through windows, as shown on the slide, or through things like closed circuit television. The final bit in the um, premises section talks about RABs, restricted access, access barrier systems and isolators. And the annex sees these as fundamental to contamination control for the manufacture of a sterile product. Um, so it says that you have to use closed RABs or isolators unless you can provide a risk assessment and scientific justification. The grade A airflow is required and in the RABs this needs to be unidirectional but not necessarily within an isolator if it's justified. There's also a strong importance of the background environment and the understanding that the background environment can be a source of contamination which can enter the RABS or the environment. And there's a big emphasis around gloves and glove integrity. So for RABS, the gloves need to be sterile 
how near the isolator needs to be able to be adequately subjected to the decontamination regime, something like vapor hydrogen peroxide. There's also a great deal of importance about leak testing of isolators and also leak testing of gloves and an assessment of integrity testing. And the annex says that there should be regular testing of glove integrity as a minimum at the beginning and end of the batch. So there may be a requirement to do that more often. And the an integrity test failure of glove could be easily be interpreted as a sign of non-sterility and regular failures would be a breakdown of the sterility assurance system. The frequency of glove changes must be defined within the contamination control strategy. And there's also an emphasis upon the decontamination mechanisms for rams and isolators, and both need to be using a sporicidal agent, which could be manual for rabs and certainly automated for an isolator and perhaps automated for the rabs as well. And the annex also says that the um, assessment of residues is really important and each facility needs to prove that there is no risk of residues remaining that might get into the product and cause damage to the product. So there's often an assessment that's undertaken by, say, a R&D or a chemistry department. OK, so that brings this part of the Annex 1 review to an end. So that was um, our little look into premises. And next time we're going to have a look at clean room and clean air equipment qualifications. So thank you for watching the video. I'm Tim Sandal. Have a great day and until next time, goodbye bye.